ladies and gentlemen, welcome back from coffee. The next talk this morning is by Dr. Mark Moore. Mark began experimenting with making stone tools in his early teens and went on to obtain a master's in archaeology from Ball State University. He immigrated with his family to Australia in 1996 and received his PhD in 2005 from the University of New England. That's the one in New South Wales, Australia, not the one in Maine. He currently holds a postdoctoral research fellowship through the Australian Research Council at the University of New England. Mark's particular expertise involves the reconstruction of stone tool reduction sequences. He, interested, he is interested in trying to track the evolution of human cognition through an understanding of stone flaking techniques. Most recently, he has been concerned with the stone artifacts made and left by the hobbits in Liangbua Cave. Mark, stone tools and hominins on floras. Good morning. Um, I'd first like to thank uh, the Turkana Basin Institute for inviting me to uh, come back to America and talk to you all about uh, the stone tools from Flores. I believe this is a the first time I've had a chance to uh, pull all the different threads of the story together um, in one uh, public lecture. So we'll go ahead and get started. Now, most of the lectures in this symposium are discussing the issues surrounding Homo floresiensis through analysis of the hobbit bones themselves. This is because the features of the skeleton are the direct data for characterizing and describing this creature. Now, I will discuss a less direct type of data, the stone artifacts recovered from Liangbua. This will involve a foray into a rather obscure corner of archaeology, the, the study of uh, how stone tools were made. But it's worth it because, as I hope to show, the story from Flores is both surprising and illuminating. Now, I will first describe the stone tools excavated from Unit 4, a layer of soil buried about 20 feet below the modern surface of Liang Bua, dated to between about 61 and 74,000 years ago. My description will focus on how hominids made those tools. Next, we will trace that technology deeper into the cave to 100,000 years ago, and then outward to the site of Mare Menge on Flores, some 840,000 years old. And finally, we will go back to the African tools from the developed old one industry about one and a half million years ago. I suspect that few of you are conversant with stone flaking, so the next step is to explore this process to give you a feel for what simple and complex means in the context of hitting two rocks together. This will provide the background for returning forward in time to the arrival of modern humans at Liangbua and the unexpected story their tools are telling us. To start our discussion, this slide is a schematic drawing of the soil units excavated in Liangbua Cave. The left-hand side shows part of the layer cake of artifact-studded soil, in this case from Unit 4. The right-hand side is a model showing the distribution and age of the cave's principal soil units. The skulls show the distribution of hominid bones through this layer cake. Hobbit bones date before 17,000 years ago, and modern Homo sapiens remains date after 11,000 years ago. Now, it's important to understand that archaeologists infer that stone tools were made by the hominin species whose bones they are found in association with. This is, in fact, the only empirical way we can peg artifacts to hominins. So on this basis, we infer that hobbits made the stuff dating prior to 17,000 years ago, and modern humans made the stuff dating after 11,000 years ago. So given the importance of the hominid bone distribution to this premise, how much faith can we put in it? Well, our deep excavations at the cave have water sieved hundreds of tons of soil through one eighth inch mesh or smaller, and to date this pattern of hominin distribution has been confirmed annually. It appears then that the pattern is very robust. The flat floor of the cave we see in photos is quite different from the nature of the cave floor from the early period that kicks off our discussion between 61 and 74,000 years ago. Stone workers during that period lived on the high spots amid an undulating cave floor cut by streams, partly covered by ponds, and with a 30-foot waterfall out the back. 
Many of the tools in the following slides came from a living surface near the roof fall at the center of the cave floor, about 20 feet below the table indicated in this panoramic photo. Stone suitable for flaking into tools is not readily available in the cave, and the hobbits had to carry it there. As it happens, the nearby Wairichang River is stuffed full of good quality volcanic tuff, the legacy of submarine volcanic eruptions millions of years ago. However, the stones in the riverbed are quite large and heavy, and transporting them to the cave was a problem. Hobbits solved the problem by first flaking the stones into portable pieces, measuring about two inches across, and carrying those pieces back to the cave. The pieces of stone were themselves used as tools and were also the source of smaller usable pieces. Uh, just some terminology, the pieces broken from a stone are called flakes, and the stone itself is a core. Those terms I'll be using throughout the talk. The stone workers also collected volcanic river cobbles to use as hammer stones and carried those to the cave. Most of the stone reduction inside Liangbua involved reducing flake blanks produced at the river into smaller flakes and tools. The flakes themselves were razor edged and made excellent cutting implements and the core edges were sharp and durable. Discarded flakes and cores form the bulk of the artifacts found in these early levels. This video shows how flake blanks were reduced inside the cave based on the results of our analysis. Hammerstone blows were struck within about six millimeters of the core's edge on average, attesting to excellent hand-eye coordination. Flakes were struck from both faces and around the periphery, creating irregular but roughly round or ovoid cores. This flaking involved free hand blows in the sense that the core was probably held in the hand like you see here. Sometimes a free hand blow was struck in such a way that the flake ran down the edge of the core. Archaeologists call this a Buren technique. Other times, the flake blank or core was placed flat on an anvil and broken by striking the face, what I call a truncation technique. Now, these three techniques, freehand, burin, and truncation, were combined to reduce the cores. Less than three blows were normally struck in series, followed by reorientation of the core, followed by a few more blows, and so on. Cores were often abandoned after only nine blows. Now, this video compresses what was probably a drawn-out process into about 60 seconds. In reality, the stone workers were making these flakes to use, of course, so the process would presumably have been stretched out over lots of cutting tasks, consuming hours or perhaps days of activity. One other reduction technique was applied by these stone workers, the bipolar technique. This involved holding a flake blank edge on onto an anvil and striking the upper edge, shattering the flake. The bipolar technique was always applied separately from those other three stone working techniques. These images show some of the sorts of stone artifacts we excavated at Liangbua. Now, archaeologists are left with the discarded bits from stoneworking activities, and to make sense of them, we place them into meaningful categories. The Liangbua material is amorphous stuff, but the use of different flaking techniques gave us a framework for classifying the pieces. In total, our Indonesian Australian team has closely analyzed about uh, 8,400 stone artifacts associated with hobbits at Liangbua and 3,200 associated with modern humans. This is by far the largest collection of well-dated Pleistocene stone tools from Southeast Asia. And I might note that there's, there's a considerable number more artifacts uh, in Jakarta that we still haven't looked at yet. Now, our research focus was on how these tools were made, but it raises the obvious question of what they were used for. Now, the flakes and cores produced in the cave were mostly small and inconsistently shaped. Nowadays, we tend to think of tools as discrete objects for specific tasks, such as a screwdriver or a wrench. But in contrast, it appears to me that the Liangbua toolmakers produced usable edges rather than tools in our modern sense. Two sorts of usable edges were produced, the sharp, unmodified edges of flakes and the rather less sharp but stronger and steeper edges on cores. Popular images of hobbits using stone axes and handles and stone-tipped spears are, in my view, fanciful. 
Now, having said this, the objects we call perforators may be aimed at tools in our more modern sense. A perforator is a flake which has itself been flaked or retouched. The retouched edges seem to form an all-like projection, calling to mind all sorts of possible piercing tasks. However, it's not entirely clear whether the stonework is set out to produce a tool of this shape or whether I, as a modern human archaeologist, have simply pattern-matched these from amorphous retouched flakes and cores, pulling them out of context for special emphasis. Now, once we had reconstructed the outline of the reduction sequence, our analysis began to drill down into the technology. We were keen to determine how the flaking techniques were integrated with each other and how combinations of techniques produced the sorts of tools we excavated from the cave. Once we had done this analysis and with the information in hand, we next compared the tools from Unit 4 at Liangbua to those from Units 2 and 3, dating up to 40,000 years earlier. We compared the types of debris, the frequency of techniques, and the various permutations of how techniques were organized. And we found no significant differences in the way tools were made across this period. We also compared the Unit 4 pattern to the tools from Unit 7, dating just prior to the disappearance of Homo floresiensis from the cave. And again, we found no significant difference with the Unit 4 tools. This means that hobbits at Liangbua made tools in the same way for some 83,000 years, from initial occupation right through to abandonment. So next we turned to elsewhere on floors, comparing the Liangbua tools with those from Mademenge, located 50 kilometers east of Liangbua and some 740,000 years earlier. The analysis was done by our Indonesian-Australian research team, which allowed us to stay consistent with our approach and observations. And we found that the tools at Marimenge were made in the same way as the tools at Liangbua, resulting in very similar stone products and debris. So finally, we went right back to the historical source of stone working, the stone artifacts from the earliest sites in Africa. We reclassified the tools from Mare Menge and Liangbua into the descriptive framework devised by Mary Leakey for the stone tools at Olduvai Gorge. Leakey's categories for the early African tools, called the developed Oldowan industry, neatly encompasses the types of tools discovered on Flores. And this industry dates to about one and a half million years ago in Africa. So what does this incredibly long period of technological stasis mean? Well, we believe that the similarity in stone tools between Matamenge and the early part of the Liangbua sequence reflects a historical trajectory. The reasons the tools were made in a similar way is because the hominids at Matamenge were the direct ancestors of the hobbits at Liangbua. The same technological adaptation to the florist environment was passed down for some 820,000 years. Although such a pattern is unheard of for behaviorally modern humans, such long periods of technological stasis are typical of our remote ancestors in Africa. Now, as we learn in coming lectures about the unusual hobbit body morphology and adaptation to flores, think about this unchanging technology. I think there's two points that can be made here. First, whatever selective forces were at play to alter the hobbit's body morphology, the technological adaptation was retained. Stone technology was clearly of paramount importance to hobbits. And second, despite the importance of this technological adaptation, it did not free these hominids from selective forces acting on their bodies. Whatever these selective forces might have been, they were not ameliorated by the stone technology. So, what about the similarity of the florist tools with the early African stone tools? I think the sim similarities are compelling, but at this stage, it might be a bit of a stretch to suggest a historical connection across this vast gap in geography. But despite this, the stone artifact evidence doesn't contradict such a connection. The tools are about what you might expect for an early hominin that left Africa around one and a half million years ago, or earlier even, with a developed old one toolkit. Okay, so on to our next topic. Where does this way of making stone tools sit in terms of technical complexity? The subject stirred up a bit of controversy when the discovery of Homo floresiensis was first announced, 
So to get a good grasp on this, it's useful to look at stone tool making in more depth. Now, I think it's fair to say that most people assume that making stone tools is a simple process. I mean, what can be harder than hitting two rocks together? Indeed, the term Stone Age is modern shorthand for the technologically primitive. The effortless way that the experienced stone worker detaches sharp-edged flakes appears to confirm this. The motions and manipulations are so fluid that they appear almost random, as if there's no thought behind the process. Yet this fluidity disguises the fact that stoneworking is a fundamentally non-intuitive process, controlled by the physics of fracture and limited by our hominin bodies. To consistently remove flakes cleanly from a core, the stoneworker must strike a core edge where the faces are oriented at an acute angle to one another. Further, the acute angled edge must also be adjacent to a ridge or lump of high mass on the face of the core. The ridge or lump channels the force so that the crack continues running to the base of the core or exits cleanly out the side. Once this ge geometrical arrangement is identified, the stone worker must manipulate the core until it's in the proper configuration relative to the hammer arc and then deliver a blow of just the right strength and orientation. Anyone who's attempted to master golf or similar ball sports can appreciate the difficulties involved. Now this video shows an archaeology student's first attempts at striking flakes from a core. The student understands what he needs to do because I told him, but as you can see, he isn't having much luck. I found that on average between two and three hours of hands-on instruction, at least, are required to teach a student how to strike off decent flakes. And they always blame the hammerstone as well, which is always interesting. Okay, so returning to our video, lots of flakes were usually struck from a core, a process that raises additional factors that need to be considered. When a flake is struck, it takes with it the lump of high mass that channeled the fracture. Removing the flake creates a hollow on the core called a flake scar. This, in effect, raises the mass to either side of the hollow. The stone worker can target one of these newly configured zones of high mass to remove the next flake. As you can see in the video, the stoneworker tilts and turns the core to find these new zones of high mass and lines up behind one and strikes off another flake. A skilled napper can chase around the core, simultaneously creating and removing zones of high mass until the stone becomes too small to hold. The result is a sharp-edged core covered in flake scars and a pile of exceptionally useful flakes. Now, the ability to strike a flake cleanly from the core is the entry point into making stone tools. Mastered by hominins about uh, two and a half million years ago in Africa, but this is beyond the capacity of our chimpanzee relatives, and for that matter, most of you in the audience, at least without considerable practice and tutoring. As for the cognition behind them, these early stone tools tended to reflect the shapes of the stones they were made on. The flake removals were linked together in simple chains, and the shape of the stone strongly influenced the shape of the discarded core. So while these early stone flaking hominins excelled at the removal, controlled removal of flakes, the forms they produce were poorly differentiated. Now, I would argue that hobbit tools reflect a similar level of stone working complexity. There's no question that these early stone workers were exceptionally skilled at striking stone flakes. They clearly had a sophisticated understanding of the geometries and the physics involved in this. Yet, I've seen no indication that the Liangbua stone workers did anything other than remove flakes in simple chains. And yes, there is a much more complex way to flake stone. With practice, a stone worker can predict how removing a flake will change the distribution of high mass on the core. This realization was a turning point in technological evolution because by anticipating the effect removing a flake would have on a core, a stone worker could begin to think several steps ahead. Instead of thinking in a linear fashion, and removing flakes in chain-like series, stone workers began to think hierarchically, removing flakes in the near term in anticipation of how, and how that would influence results many flake removals into the future. 
In this example, Aborigines in Queensland remove flakes in steps one to three to set up the removal of a triangular spear point in step four. They clearly thought and acted hierarchically to achieve their goal. Now to help visualize this, think about how you slice up a block of cheese. Most of us simply cut slices from the end of the block in chain-like series, and this creates rectangular cheese slices. But say your toddler decides she will only eat triangular cheese slices. This calls for dramatic action. Now, one way to consistently make triangular cheese slices is to cut the block into a triangle shape beforehand by slicing off the corners. This is a hierarchical approach to the problem where the objective of triangular cheese slices was met by initially slicing the cheese blocks into a triangular volume. Now, the first clear examples of hierarchical thinking and stone flaking are found in South Africa, dating between about 60 and 65,000 years ago. Nappers there made long, narrow flakes called blades and shaped them into crescents, presumably for gluing onto a spear shaft or handle. Now, this sort of thinking behind the manufacturing process, which must, like that, use to produce triangular, sli triangular slices from our block of cheese. Hierarchical thinking dominated the way that behaviorally modern Homo sapiens made stone tools in Africa, Europe, and West Asia. So, following on from this, we might anticipate complex stoneworking patterns associated with the modern human colonizers at Liangbua. This expectation is at least partly met. Modern human burials in the cave from about 4,000 years ago include edge ground adzes made by a complex hierarchical technique that involved using a punch to strike off flakes. The adzes themselves were made at workshops outside the cave, such as Golo Roeng, located across the river. But note that these complex tool tools date some 7,000 years after modern humans arrived at the cave. But we also see changes in the Liangbua stone technology that correlate with the arrival of modern humans at 11,000 years ago. Now the y-axis on these charts is divided into 10 centimeter excavation levels called spits with the present cave floor at the top. We think that modern humans arrived at about spit 40, about 11 feet below the modern cave floor. The data on the x-axis show that this corresponds with some dramatic changes in certain aspects of the stone tools. First, modern humans preferred a high-quality nodular chert to the silicified tuff favored by hobbits. We have yet to discover the quarry for this chert, although our discussion with Thomas last night suggests that he, he might know where it is now. Um, but I suspect that it's relatively close to the cave. Second, modern humans used fire much more extensively than hobbits. A large proportion of the stone artifacts associated with modern humans sustained damage by being scuffed into fires. Although burned artifacts were found in association with hobbits, suggesting they did use fire, these are exceptionally rare. And third, chert flakes with edge gloss from processing, processing silica-rich plant materials appear soon after the arrival of modern humans. Silica was transferred from the plant material onto this edge through use, creating that glossy patch that you can see in the slide. Edge gloss flakes are relatively common on later prehistoric sites across Indonesia. Some authors have suggested that they may have resulted from processing plants for basketry or mats. So the stone tool evidence points to clear behavioral differences between modern humans and hobbits, as you might expect. But to me, the most surprising pattern we documented is that modern humans made their stone tools in the same way as Homo floresiensis. This slide of both hobbit and modern human tools shows just how similar they were. Without knowing the provenance of the artifacts within the cave deposits, you'd be hard-pressed to distinguish the hobbit tools from the modern ones. Modern humans preferred a different type of stone from hobbits, and they used some of these tools for a different purpose, but they flaked the stones using the same techniques applied in nearly identical ways and produced the same sorts of tools and byproducts. Now, if Homo floresiensis and Homo sapiens made stone tools in similar ways, what does this mean for stone technology 
and human evolution. I think the principal point is that although complex hierarchical thinking is without question a hallmark of modern human cognition, this does not automatically mean that such thinking was expressed in the stone technology. Stone tools can reflect maximum cognitive abilities, but they don't do so necessarily. Although we can make cheese triangles, most of the time cheese rectangles will suffice. This lesson might also apply to non-modern hominins. Although stone tools are the most comprehensive evidence we have for behavior in the remote past, using stone flaking as a proxy may underestimate cognitive evolution. So how did Homo sapiens wind up making tools in the same way of Homo, as Homo floresiensis? The, the big question here. One possible explanation is convergence. The technology I've described is a very simple one, so perhaps the two hominins arrived at this toolkit independently as some basic way of breaking rocks. Personally, I don't find this particularly compelling given the, the techniques and the similar patterns in which they were applied. Convergence might explain the broad outlines of simple technologies, but not the specifics of how the techniques were arranged in relation to one another. The Hobbit and modern human toolkits are nearly identical. Now for a more speculative scenario. Another possibility is that Homo sapiens and Homo floresiensis adopted the same way of flaking tools through interaction with each other. Given the historical roots of the way tools were flaked on flores, this means that the modern human colonizers of island Indonesia copied this way of making tools from hobbits. Now we know that modern humans were in Southeast Asia for at least 29,000 years prior to their appearance at Liangbua. This provided ample time for mutual observation. The surprising thing in this scenario is the direction of the information flow from evolutionarily early hominins to us. So, to summarize, 840,000 years ago, the presently unidentified ancestors of hobbits arrived on Flores and camped at Maremenge. They carried a toolkit like that made in Africa during the developed Oldowan about one and a half million years ago. Their descendants, the hobbits, moved into Liangbua some 740,000 years later, soon after the cave became habitable. They carried the same sort of toolkit with them, discarding thousands of core and flake tools onto the cave floor until they disappeared from our view about 17,000 years ago. Sometime in the subsequent 6,000 years, modern humans moved into the cave. Although their tools were made from different sorts of stone and they were used in different ways to their predecessors, they had essentially adopted the hobbit stone flaking strategy. This in turn just might mean that hobbits and modern humans interacted on this remote and exotic island. Thank you. We have a few moments. Are there any questions for Dr. Moore? Is there any evidence that the No, all all of the stone uh, made by Homo floresiensis at Liangbua is sourced from the local environment. Um, there's clues in the landscape that, that uh, they did use chert. Homo floresiensis used chert in small proportions. Um, but there's evidence that even that occurs locally. And as I was saying, Thomas has told me that, that it doesn't appear to be the case. So there's no evidence of long-distance trade um, in the stone materials associated with uh, Homo floresiensis. Um, as for the modern humans, um, there's no clear evidence in, in stone trade for their tools either, although the, there's lots of evidence from those layers that I haven't discussed that there is incredible amount of trade going on. And there's uh, metal, for instance, in some of those upper deposits. Yes, there were. 
Um, comments. Well, I can tell you that the, the raw material proportions or the, the, the uh, focus on raw material reflects the earlier material. There's quite a bit of volcanic tuff. If uh, those charts, if you can recall those charts, uh, that profile for the uh, Pleistocene deposits uh, for raw materials does continue through that gap. And also, um, I can, the stone artifacts, uh, the way that they are flaking the stone, the cores and the tool types are the same in that, in that zone as well. Um, there's some ambiguity about um, that particular stratigraphic unit in the cave. It's stratigraphic unit 8. There's a possibility that there's some reworked material in there. So even though I analyzed all that material, I left it out of my analyses just to make sure that, that everything here was, was good. Unfortunately, we have to move on. Thank you very much, Dr. Moore. The next talk this morning is by Professor Dean Falk. This is Dean's second foray to Stony Brook. The last time was 20 years ago when she talked about the brain of Paranthropus. Dean is the Hale G. Smith Professor of Anthropology at Florida State University. She received her bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of Illinois, majoring in anthropology and mathematics. Interesting combination. She went on to receive her PhD from the University of Michigan. Dean was professor of anatomy at the University of Puerto Rico, professor of anthropology at SUNY Albany, and since 2001 she's been at Florida State University. She is currently a res resident scholar at the School for Advanced Research in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Except for that brief foray in Albany, it's clear that she clearly appreciates more pleasurable climatic conditions than we seem to be experiencing here. Dean has published over 70 peer-reviewed scientific articles and has sole-authored at least six books by my last count. Her most recent, Finding Our, Ma Our, excuse me, Finding Our Tongues, Mothers, Infants, and the Origins of Language, was published just earlier this year. Dean's overriding interest is in comparative neuroanatomy, the evolution of the brain, and of cognition. Professor Falk, Wentz Homo Floresiensis, Clues from the Brain. Um, can you hear me? I'm wired, so I'm not going to speak into that, okay? Uh, thank you very much, Fred, for that nice introduction. I want to begin by thanking the doctors, Leakey, the uh, Turkana Basin Institute, and, and of course Stony Brook for putting on this uh, marvelous conference. Uh, would that when I was a student that um, such things happen, but so I think the students here are, are very fortunate. I work with a team, and sometimes there are as many as 10 people on this team, but this is a nucleus. So you're looking at folks from Mallinckrodt Institute of Radiology at Washington University School of Medicine, and this is the Electronic Radiology Lab. Oops. And Fred Pryor up here. See if I can get this pointer to work. This is Fred Pryor. He's head of the lab, and he has a master's degree in anthropology. So he's just interested in this, which is um, our team's good fortune. Kirk Smith is a crackerjack engineer who's done some of the CT reconstructions. Charles Hildebold, you'll be hearing from later. So I've worked very happily with this team for at least two decades and maybe longer, and it was our incredible good luck to be allowed to work on the brain case of Hobbit. And you're looking at a marvel of engineering. The CT, the three-dimensional CAT scan data, were sent to, um, to St. Louis, and courtesy of Mike Morwood and Peter Brown and our other colleagues, where uh, Kirk Smith and another engineer worked on them in order to render what is called a virtual image. So you're looking at a translucent virtual skull of LB1, and it's been flood-filled in order to create what's called a virtual endocast, and it looks quite a bit like a brain. This is a marvelous endocast. It picks up um, so much detail. So we were very fortunate, and we, um, did, we've done several studies 
um, of this end of cast. The first one was shortly after Hobbit was announced in 2005, and the images on the left come from that study. So first pass through, we've got top views, Hobbit's in the middle here, and the right side, this is Hobbit here, and we compared the virtual endocast with that of a pygmy female with a chimpanzee with a homo erectus and with a pathological uh, human who has microcephaly. And we compared these statistically and were very surprised to, um, and maybe we shouldn't have been, but to, to, to see that the endocast of LB1 most resembled Homo erectus, and these have all been put at the same size, so we could do these comparisons. So in terms of the shape, it's very much like that of Homo erectus, and at least resemble the microcephalic. Since then, we've done a number of studies, and, and I'll talk a little bit about the microcephalic work in a moment, but most recently, we've looked more extensively at, the, at LB1's endocast, and so the image on the right is now in press, it's up online at Journal of Human Evolution in the special volume that um, Mike Morwood and Bill Jungers and others have put together. And so we've um, done larger comparisons, comparing LB1's endocast to chimpanzees and some other fossils. And instead of having merely three parts of the brain that look advanced, which is what we concluded, in the initial study, we saw that the back end, the, the middle and the front, looked advanced. And we now have the features up to seven fancy or advanced or derived features of the brain of LB1, which make it look unique and sophisticated. And we've um, compared these within a historical context to what's been um, shown or what's been known about brain evolution for about 100 years. So we're confident now that we have a highly derived, but small, it's only 417 cc's, a highly derived uh, brain. And we think furthermore, because these features are all over, all over the place, all over the endocast, that we, what we have an indication of is what would be called a global reorganization. It's not just that one part changed and the other stayed the same. So despite its small size, this is a fancy brain. And so we tend to believe what our colleagues and what the discoverers have said about the cognition of Homo floresiensis, that indeed it was doing, making those tools and um, doing the hunting and using fire. In other words, the advanced cognition. Whenever something important is discovered, it seems, there's always a small group, there's always a large group of the public, and there's always a small group of scientists that naysay. Okay, they just can't believe it's real. And this happened with Tong in 1925, so they say that, no, it's an aberrant ape, or it's just a pathological specimen, for instance, Neanderthals. Or in the case of LB1, um, the suggestion has been made that, no, this is a, a human being, a homo sapiens, that was f afflicted with the disease. So it's interesting, I mean, that, that this um, has been happening for a long, long time. And I would have hoped that in this day and age we'd say, oh, we have cell phones and, and satellites, so we're beyond that. But no, we have it in full force. And the first of the, what Bill Jungers has termed, sick hobbit hypotheses, was that LB1 was a microcephalic. You're looking here at two very famous um, microcephalics, Jenny Lee and Elvira Snow, otherwise known as Zip and Pip, from early vaudeville, vaudeville days. And you can see from, um, from their uh, skulls that they tend to have pointed heads. This led to the terrible um, expression pinhead. And, um, and, from, and so the frontal lobes are narrow and pointed. And there are some other shape features which tend to typify microcephalics, although the condition is a complex one. And it can be, um, there are various different genes that can um, cause or, or be implicated in microcephaly. So we um, had looked at that one microcephalic initially, 
And some of these naysayers said, no, no, you had one bad microcephalic. So there was only one thing to do, which was a real microcephalic study. And we um, went about finding nine microcephalic skulls from which we could get CAT scan data. And these are these nine blue ones down here. Ten um, skulls from modern Homo sapiens and got their virtual endocasts. We did a statistical study to quantify shape differences between normal uh, human beings and microcephalic human beings, and then formed a function, a, a mathematical function, that would allow us to classify, down here we have um, a human dwarf who was secondarily a microcephalic, and she did classify, according to our function, with microcephalics. This is a microcephalic that our colleague at the Field Museum, Bob Martin, said looked just like LB1, and it classified as a microcephalic, which was a good thing, because it is. LB1, however, in terms of those shape features, classified with Homo sapiens. Not that it's a little tiny LB1, not that it looked entirely like Homo sapiens. It doesn't. It's its own very derived little brain. But in terms of shape features to do with the bottom back part of the brain called the cerebellum, it sticks out in back. It's relatively large and sticks out in back in microcephalics. And the frontal lobe is narrow and pointed. Those features um, allowed us to classify with 100% um, confidence LB1 and in that case, she classified with Homo sapiens. So in our view, we dispensed at that point with the microcephalic hypothesis. And we still think so. You're looking here at a microcephalic on the left, an LB1 on the right, and these endocasts look nothing alike. LB1 is the opposite in terms of these critical features of a microcephalic. That said, and we've been spending a lot of time, all of us, responding to various hypotheses of pathology, and in this instance, it proved to be very productive. We were glad that we ended up studying something we never thought we would study, and, and we would be glad, even if we didn't know about hobbits, because of something that geneticists are doing. Okay, this is a sort of compli complicated um, slide, but geneticists who are interested in uh, microcephaly think that one can use it as a pointer to do comparative genetic studies to make inferences or hypotheses about human brain evolution. So for instance, they think that brain size was selected for at a locus, which is involved in microcephaly, but when it was in its normal state, since the split with chimpanzees. So geneticists are using a pathological or a clinical condition in order to do comparative genetic studies, monkeys, apes, humans, to point them back to when in time they think evolution speeded up on brain size. We found that intriguing because it's not just that the brains of microcephalics are small, they're differently shaped. And so we thought, using that same reasoning, we would go back in the fossil record and see you know, if there was anything back there that would fit with this kind of interpretation. And indeed, there is. You're looking at, oops, you're looking at the tops of the brains here of a normal uh, human being, a microcephalic. And uh, you're looking at the right side here, the left side here. And notice that the normal in front is kind of squared off and full. And the microcephalic, typically, it's pointed up here, this sort of teardrop shape. When you go back in time and look at australopithecines, and this works from 2000 before we even knew about hobbits, uh, the grassles, Australopithecus africanus from South Africa, have this human shape, but the robust Australopithecines or Paranthropus have this teardrop shape. They look like microcephalics. And the same thing is true from the side. Microcephalics, that's a brain and a virtual endocast, tend to have kind of a flattened underneath surface to the frontal lobes, whereas normal human beings are, are expanded there, as are grassal australopithecines, but the robust australopithecines are sawed off there. So intriguingly, the shape of Paranthropus, and the oldest one is um, dated to about two and a half million years old, 
looks like that of a microcephaly. Now, we're not saying that microcephalics are descended from paranthropus, and we're not saying that paranthropines had microcephaly. But what we're saying is this might be another, this, this pathological condition might be another pointer that along with the molecular, the genetic evidence can be useful in looking at the fossil record and thinking about hominin brain evolution. The grassles were derived and they were already becoming derived in shape towards a modern condition. Paranthropus wasn't. Today, if you have a mutation in genes that were involved, uh, the derived state won't be activated and you're going to look primitive. Forget saying anything about who is exactly who's uh, descendant. All right, these features, this back end of the brain and the, the back end of the brain and the front end were really important during hominid brain evolution. That's been known for over a hundred years. And what we've captured in the microcephalic study is the saliency of that, how important that is. So we decided that finally we could get around to the question we've wanted to address for a long time, which is, can we get some clues about who Homo floresiensis uh, looks like in terms of the brain? And, okay, just, just sorry, I, I should have said this earlier. Okay, you have Paranthropus over here, just for those of you who maybe aren't anthropologists, and the Grassles here to show you who we were just talking about. So... From, uh, from our 10 normals, from then 10 microcephalics, and from certain fossils where we had really good endocasts that didn't need a lot of imagining what was missing, we collected very simple features which, in fact, captured this information. If you get this length here, and then you get a length back to the back of the cerebellum here, and you get the frontal lobe width there, and the width of the brain lower here, those capture a lot of really important information. We collected those data, and then we did a statistical analysis where we had uh, three groups. We had our, our normals, we had our microcephalics, and they completely sort from each other. And then we did a little group where we took two grassal osteolipithecines, Australopithecus africanus, and put them into the third group, and they sort differently, and yes, the sample size is small, but these statistics are statistically significant, created a classification function, and then asked the question, where did LB1 fall? And in this case, with these measurements, LB1 sorts right up here with these grassal osteolipithecines. Okay, recall that in other features, it looked like Homo erectus. In terms of... Some of the other fossils, we then put those down there, and uh, we see that uh, robust australopithecine here, WT17000, sorts completely with the microcephalics. Not terribly surprising, you just saw those images. And 1813 is curious. Some people call this Homo habilis. It's been called everything. It's been called grassl. It's been called a robust. It sorts mostly with the microcephalics, but somewhat. Some of it, uh, about 22%, would sort it up here. So it's an enigma. The one good Homo erectus skull we have that'll give us all our measurements from Hexian sorts 100% with, uh, with normal folks. All right, so we're not saying, we want to make it clear, we're not saying we think LB1 was, a, was an osteolipithecine. But we do think, and other people are, are now suggesting, well, maybe LB1's closer to Homo habilis. What we think is, this is interesting, and we don't want to rule out any possible phylogenetic inferences at this point, including, we think, the notion that um, one hypothesis would be to consider whether derived LB1, Homo floresiensis, had some ancestral history with Australopithecines, or with early Homo, or with, with Homo erectus. So we would like to see that kept on the table because these particular brain features we think are, are um, worth giving s some weight to. Okay, so here's the uh, Homo habilis slide. Uh, recently, Gordon et al. and with Bernard Wood are leaning towards a possible phylogenetic connection with Homo habilis. Again, we think it's interesting and we need to keep our options open. I don't know how I'm doing on time here. I asked Fred to do jumping jacks 
in front of me? Am I cool? Okay. Um, but this is a, a hodgepodge slide that summarizes um, a lot of the research of people in this room in terms of Homo floresiensis over here and who she looked like. Where's my pointer? There it is. And I've put in red the features which are shared with Australopithecines and also at times they're shared with early Homo. But there are a lot of them when you go through the skeleton, starting, you know, with that brain, the global uh, reorganization in those areas we talked about, of course, the stature. Um, uh, and uh, there are features, uh, a lot of this is Peter Brown's work, uh, of the premolars, of the uh, inside of the lower jaw, the inside of the mandible. Uh, Bill Jungers uh, uh, has discussed that, that quite a bit. Uh, Susan uh, Larson, I, I think we may be hearing about um, the shrugging or not shrugging shoulders. Again, you get you know an affinity with either early homo or australopithecine. Um, Matt uh, Tocheri is going to uh, tell us about the wrist, which, um, uh, and Matt, correct me when you give your talk if, if I'm wrong, but would be either australopith-like or, or ape-like. The pelvis up here looks like Lucy's. Okay, the pelvis looks like Lucy's. Um, the femur shape looks australopithecine-like. The uh, ratios between arm and leg bones, the shortness of the legs. But, of course, there are other derived or advanced features that are special. So it's its own sp species. But to, to me, this is intriguing. We're getting a lot of information that makes us think we want to, to keep that, put that that uh, hypothesis out there to think about, you know, b more broadly about uh, phylogeny. And um, so what we want to know is, and we, and we don't even have a strong hunch because we can see possibilities both ways, but were Homo floresiensis ancestors big or little? We, too, um, still keep the dwarfed Homo erectus keep that on, on the board because um, we can't rule it out and there's some things about the brain that look pretty suggestive. On the other hand, given what we just looked at, I'm not ruling out the, the little folks hypothesis. If there were, I mean, if Homo floresiensis is descended from something that was itself small when, when those ancestors got to the island, well, then that would suggest that um, more will be discovered and not just on Flores but maybe more in Eurasia. Dominici is, is interesting. Um, and I'm wondering about China. I'm wondering about drawers in museums because historically those have often produced surprising results that look different um, when new things happen. So these are the questions that keep us up at night. I'm so glad we're going to hear Jungers talking about uh, I think we all have this slide from National Geographic about uh, insular dwarfism. And what we need to know is we, we need to know what happens to the brain size relative to the body size of insular dwarfs. And I just heard we might be hearing, I, I won't say from which colleague because he didn't say I could, but I'm very excited to hear that we might get some insight about that. And uh, at one point I did some work with a student on foxes that suggest that brain size, body size might scale in an extremely surprising way in insular dwarfs. And so I look forward, that, that research needs to be done. It's just such a hot topic and, and it sounds like it's coming up or it's on its way. And again, I put this up here ju just to remind us that sure, Lucy, what, 3.2 million years ago was little but we have her so-called child at, I think the date is, at, from Olduvai Gorge, is 1.8 million years ago, and the body looked a whole lot like Lucy, small and little. You've got hints from the Republic of Georgia, although not exactly like this. The tool information is fascinating, including the superb paper that we, we just heard. So um, it's exciting times. Uh, this seems to be moving faster than historically. You know, when Pithecanthropus was an, announced, uh, th that had a, a saga. Um, uh, Australopithecus africanus, Raymond Darts, 
uh, discovery, which he published in 1925, took decades before it was accepted because of paleopolitics to do with Piltdown. Um, Neanderthals had their own checkered history. My sense is Homo floresiensis is moving more quickly, so I'm, uh, I'm so glad that um, we get to be part of this. Our uh, heartfelt gratitude, Malincrot Institute of Radiology has funded a huge part of our efforts because they're just keenly interested, the National Geographic Society has also funded some of our work. And, of course, our Indonesian and Australian colleagues, um, we're thrilled that you've let us in on the adventure. And we look forward to seeing how it unfolds. I hope it unfolds well. I'm still around. Remains to be seen. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Thank you for keeping to time, enough time that we have time for a question or two. I can't see. But, oh, there's one. Pretty. Uh, when we did it from the 3D CT data. In terms of the body size, uh, when you look at, at um, the original estimates, like Peter Brown's, the relative brain size is not big. If anything, it's like an eight, which was a surprise because one would normally expect something smaller to have a relatively bigger brain. And you can see that just looking at people growing up, Little babies, if you look at them, their heads and their brains look relatively big. As they grow up, those proportions change, even though the brain gets bigger and the body gets bigger. And those are powerful, powerful scaling laws, so much so that we expected them to apply in this case. And it was sort of bewildering. The relative brain size does not look to be the size you would expect in a miniature Homo erectus. It's off that scale as far as we can tell. Go ahead. One quick question. The Fontanelle, is that a Fontanelle or is it an injury or, you know, you that is, in babies, not in Right. That is, Charles, um, you correct me if I'm wrong, that is an artifact due to damage to the specimen, is it not? It's not an open Fontanelle, but we have an expert here. Did you want to say something no, no, about, no. yeah. Okay. Yes, I do too. And Peter. Yeah, the question was about the fontanelle, uh, apparent fontanelle. It's not a fontanelle. It was post mortem damage. And Peter Brown says they even have the piece back in Jakarta so we can put it back together. I vaguely recall from your very first paper comparing LV1 with the Stuttgart specimen that you talked about a specific basal angle of the, of the cranium. Have you done any more work in that regard, looking at that particular angle, which I think you distinguish in terms of difference between the Stuttgart specimen and the LV1 specimen, that the LV1 angle was Okay, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not quite positive what that was. We lined them up according to a certain angle to do some overlaps to see profiles. And, um, and the microcephalics all have this same basic shape with the cerebellum pushed out and back. When we put LB1 on there, its profile was totally different. LB1 is the antithesis. It's not narrow in the frontal lobes, it's wide in the frontal lobes. Its occipital lobe juts out over the cerebellum as it does in Homo sapiens. So LB1 couldn't look further from a microcephalic. We, we think that hypothesis is, is dead. 
And as you may know, the people, the sick Hobbit hypothesis people, have moved on to other pathologies. Laren syndrome uh, was suggested, and there's, um, we've got a response to that, which is now online at AJPA. Uh, Bill Jungers is heading up the soon-to-be submitted response on cretinism. And uh, it won't surprise me if they come up with more diseases. If they give us a specific disease, well, then if you want to do science, you, sort of, you can't ignore it. So it's taken our time to answer these. But so far, I think they're answered, completely answered. What we can't answer is when somebody goes, excuse me, there are 400 different conditions that, uh, in which the brain can be small. You have to prove that LB1 didn't have any of them. That's not a testable hypothesis. So uh, we'll probably be doing, is there another one? Is cretinism the latest? Okay, Th thank you very much. Thank you very much. I can take care of this one, yeah. You're going to have to take it because I don't know how, I don't know how a map works. It's fine. Complete, I'm a complete idiot. Like a minute. There we go. Thank you, Dean. The next talk uh, this morning is by Professor Peter Brown. Peter obtained his PhD from Australian National University and is currently professor holding the chair of paleoanthropology at the University of New England again, the one in New South Wales. His principal research interests are in human evolution and human variation, and especially the origin and dispersion of modern humans in Asia and Australasia. Peter is an expert on skulls and teeth. He is currently completing research on some late Pleistocene human fossils from southeastern Australia, which may help resolve the debate over the origin and first of the first Australians. This morning, however, Peter's going to be talking about hobbits, and Peter was responsible for describing the first skeletal remains of the hobbit and in 2004 assigning it to a new species, Homo floresiensis. Peter's talk is coming up in a moment. It's a frightening title. Excellent. Peter Brown, her teeth were sharp, her gums were raw, and spit was dripping from her jaw. I'm not sure I want to stand this close to this fellow. The little things that make us human. Professor Brown. Uh, thank you, Fred. Before I begin, I'd like to thank the Takara Institute and Bill Youngers and all the people involved in getting me here today. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'm not going to talk about anything new. I'm going to talk about six seconds of my time in 2004 where I decided that the skeleton that I could see before me wasn't a member of our species. So I'll be talking about what it's not, not what it actually is. I'd thank, like to thank um, my daughter, my three-year-old daughter, 
for suggesting the title to me. She has a fascination with children's literature, which is thinly disguised horror stories. And the title comes from reading one of these horror stories to her recently. He's got a bit of a problem with his leg. <sighs> Goodness gracious. Okay, I hope this works. The Little Riding Hood story is an exercise in taxonomy. Little Riding Hood has to dis decide very quickly, this is not going to work too well, very, very quickly whether the wolf is a member of her species and is going to eat her or not, whether she should fight or flee. Distinguishing between species is something we learn at our mother's breast, mother's knee, where we first learn to identify close siblings, family members. Later in time, we broaden our experience and begin to identify other parts of the environment we come in contact to. This is something that we're all quite good at. Distinguishing between some species and ourselves is very, very simple. In the Red Riding Hood example, she depended upon clues provided by the facial skeleton and the dentition, something which anthropologists do all of the time. We do it all of the time because these are bits and pieces which preferentially preserve in the fossil record. Here's an example of the Hadar material. We have lots of teeth and jaws, providing lots of information. And so it's good stuff to work with. Now, distinguishing between some species and ourselves is really straightforward. You've looked at this slide. Maybe your heart rate's increased a little bit. Your brain's telling you, this is not my mother, this is not a close sibling, this is not somebody I want to have babies with, and should I run away or stand around and fight? Um, very simple with something like a member of the baboon family. They have very large canine teeth. They have the hairy bodies, the big facial skeletons. They have different colours. Clearly not a member of our species. But for other species, it becomes a little bit more complicated because the distinctions are quite fine. At the same time, there are clear distinctions between our skulls and teeth and facial skeletons and all of the other primates alive in the world today. I could cover the stage with, with primate skulls and stick a human skull down with them and you'd have absolutely no trouble at all in picking out the human skull. Large inflated brain case, small facial skeleton, small teeth makes it obvious which one is the human. At the same time, th there are things which... At, at a finer level, things which are not as quite as obvious in terms of distinguishing between non-human primates and ourselves. And I want to focus just on two things, two things which were very important to me around about five years ago in, in deciding, before I knew anything about brain size or limb proportions or skeletal robusticity or anything else about the skeleton, two things which made it very, very clear that the part of the skeleton in front of me could not have belonged to our species. I was absolutely certain. I think it took me six seconds to decide that. Someone a little bit smarter may have been able to make the same decision in around about three, three seconds. I think it was just that obvious. And at the same time, there are other things which are going on which cause a great level of confusion in my mind because I've been working in Asia for something like 20 years. I knew what to expect at a particular location and a particular point in time. And something I've struggled with ever since is that the fossils on Flores are in many respects both in the wrong place and at the wrong time, which is why I'm taking the easy path today and talking about what it isn't rather than what it is. It's not because I don't have an idea of what it is, and I'm happy to talk about that later in question time. It would just take me more than 25 minutes to try and explain what I think it is. This has really got to fit better than this. Now, 
now we're cooking. Uh, the modern humans I'll use today, not because they just happen to suit my argument, they're all going to be Edo period Japanese, 200 to 300 years ago. I'll be using them as a reference population. Um, they're modern humans because they have a nice prominent chin clearly on their face, just as we all do, and their sleep remains show exactly the same thing as well. I'd like to stop and fix this. So I'll be using Edo period Japanese as my reference population. If you compare human skeletal material with non-human primates, it doesn't matter if you pick a big one or a small one, there are some features which distinguish between them. I'll concentrate on just two, uh, the first premolar tooth in the lower jaw and the symphysis, the front of the mandible. If you take a large one, a gorilla, you'll see that the, the front of the, the lower jaw is receding when you look at it from the side. There is no bony projecting chin on the front of the jaw. And if you look at the premolar teeth, the first premolar tooth in the lower jaw is elongated, whereas the second premolar tooth in the lower jaw is quite small and rounded in comparison to the first. It doesn't matter which primate you're looking at, they all have these features. All non-human primates have a receding uh, lower jaw, they don't have a chin, and the first premolar tooth in the lower jaw is elongated, whereas the second premolar tooth is small and rounded. In non-human primates, the first premolar tooth has two roots. All modern humans, everyone in this room, has a single root in the lower premolar tooth, and both the premolar teeth in our lower jaw are very similar in size and shape. Modern human, again, one of these edos, and if you look at the, the two lower premolar teeth, this is the reverse of a common non-human primate situation in modern humans. The first premolar tooth is usually somewhat smaller than the second premolar tooth. The, sec the first premolar tooth is a little bit pointier. People describe it as being a little bit more like a canine in some respects, whereas the second premolar tooth is somewhat flatter, a little bit more like a molar tooth. Modern humans, you look at the, the front of the jaw, we have a bony projecting chin and often the chin juts forward rather than being inclined backwards like in apes. Both these things, the fact that our first premolar tooth is, has a single root, is not elongated, and the fact that we have a projecting bony chin make us unique amongst all primates. No other primate has these features. If you go back in the fossil record far enough, back to the early Australopithecines, you find the distinction starts to blur because some of them, in fact most of them, have a receding um, profile to the lower jaw. They don't have a bony chin and their first premolar is elongated and has two roots. So that's the primitive condition for, for hominid bipeds, having no chin and this um, peculiar elongated first premolar tooth, very distinct from what we have today. So I just want to have a look at these two things, the shape of the mandible and the size of this first premolar tooth. In 2003, Mike Maud came to, came to my office and laboratory with the cast of a tooth and asked me what I thought about this tooth. And I think he'd already shown it to some colleagues in Indonesia and he'd been, been carrying it back. I was aware at the time that Mike was working in Indonesia. He'd been working at Mata Menga. Um, I knew the Mata Menga site was probably around about 800,000 years in age, but he'd been working at a a late Pleistocene, early Holocene site ever since at, at Liang Bua. So I had some idea of the possible age of this tooth. And I thought, well, it's a, probably around about 14 to 16,000 years old, so one part of my brain saying, how interesting can it be? Modern humans have been in the region at least since 50,000 years ago because that's when they got to Australia. But I looked at the tooth and I thought, it's, it's human-like, but it's not human. The, the length of the crown was very elongated and the root was very complex. It was broad and squashed and looked like a couple of roots squashed into one. And then, of course, I, I thought about previously published literature, particularly by Bernard Wooden colleagues, describing the early um, African hominid premolar teeth, 
and invariably they tended to have a similar morphology and often did with an elongated crown and a very complex root rather than having a single cone-like root as we found, find in modern humans. So to me this was human-like but not human. And because Mike had been working at Mataminga and the site overlapped in time that of Homo erectus, I'm thinking, oh, maybe this is a Homo erectus tooth, a Homo erectus premolar tooth. But it's only 14,000 years old. So it, it didn't make sense to me at all. And like I'd been teaching various versions of human evolution for 20,000, for, for, it seemed like 20,000 years, for, 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 for 20 years, and this just, just didn't fit with the stories, the perceived wisdom which was running around at the time. So I thought something was wrong. If you think something's wrong, um, you can always blame the archaeologists and the dating experts and say they must be wrong. It, it can't be 14,000, 18,000 years old. Little things move around in archaeological sites due to treadage, the animals burrow through sites. It's, it's not an uncommon thing to happen. So maintaining some scepticism here, saying, yes, it's, it's human-like, it doesn't look to be human, but worried about the fact that it's only 14 to 18,000 years old. It, it didn't make so much sense. Later that week, Mike announced that the, the archaeological team, led by Thomas and colleagues, had uncovered a burial. And... I could remember Mike coming down with this line drawing. I don't know if Thomas did it or, or one, one of your colleagues, but of the burial in situ. And you looked at it, and, and you could tell it was a primate. Um, it probably wasn't a macaque, but you couldn't really tell from the drawing. It looked like it, it was probably a human, but you couldn't tell it was an adult or a child, and you couldn't really tell if it was big or small. But, but Thomas was convinced, quite rightly, that this was from a very small skeleton, and he thought it was quite interesting. There was some need for haste. For a variety of reasons, um, Mike wanted to go to Jakarta and have a look at the skeleton as quickly as possible. So if I hadn't seen the teeth, I would, tooth, I wouldn't have got on the plane because what do archaeologists know about skeletons after all? Like it's only 14,000 years old. The chances are it's a, it's a human child or an infant. And so I can remember all the way flying to Jakarta, these things going through my brain and expecting to find a modern human infant when I arrived at the, the Arkanas in Jakarta. When I got there, Thomas had already cleaned the lower jaw. So I walked through into the laboratory and the lower jaw had been cleaned and glued back together. And the first thing I saw was the front of the symphysis and within... Four to six seconds, my brain said, this is not a human, it comes from another species, it is possibly Homo erectus, it really can't only be 14 to 18,000 years old, what the hell is it doing here? And something just didn't make sense at all. And this is something that I have struggled with um, ever since, I suppose. Now... For the remainder of the talk, I just want to talk about why I believed in four to six seconds, despite years of training and experience, that this could not have been a modern human. Like sometimes intellectual baggage you carry is a good thing. Sometimes it causes you lots of grief. And in this case, I'm, I was fortunate to have seen every other fossil around in China and Southeast Asia and India and other parts of the, of the region. So I had something to compare, compare them with. I worked on a time range in China, for example, from about one million up until um, modern humans appeared in China. I knew what was supposed to be there, but again, none of it fitted with this particular discovery on Flores. The thing I first noticed, I suppose, when looking at the mandible was that I'd seen this tooth. I really wanted to know if it had similar sorts of teeth because the, the teeth was unique and remarkable. So. I looked at the shape of the crowns of the teeth. And this slide compares premolar teeth in modern humans with the premolar teeth from the two Liang Bua mandibles. I hope you can see there are some differences between them with the Liang Bua specimens having a very large and elongated first premolar tooth. These premolar teeth are very similar in shape to some of the early Australopithecine specimens from East Africa. For example, they're quite similar to Laetoli hominid 4, which is a type specimen to for Australopithecus afarensis. I'm not saying this is an Australopithecine, 
but they reflected the primitive hominid condition and were very different to those in modern humans. There is lots of variation in modern human premolar teeth, but the variation is never such to encompass the kind of variation you see in the Liang Bu material. It was quite distinct, and I was pleased that the first isolated incisor, the mandible discovered in 2003, and then the mandible later discovered in 2004, had identical shapes in the crowns of the premolar teeth. Um, the premolar teeth are quite worn. The modern humans don't have that same degree of tooth wear, but even without the tooth wear, there's no way those premolar teeth look like modern human premolar teeth. The other unique characteristic of um, modern human premolars is they have a single root. Something like 98% of modern humans have a single conical root in the first premolar and about 99% of modern humans have a single conical root in the second premolar. Non-human primates nearly always have double roots for their first premolar in the lower jaw. Chimpanzees have two roots in the second premolar in the lower jaw. Gorillas have a very complex flattened type root in the second premolar of the lower jaw. If you go back in time to early African hominids, a high frequency of them have multiple roots in their first premolar and also multiple roots in their second premolar as well. So again, this provided some information for me to go on in terms of putting the H. floresiensis material in context. It's a slide showing root morphology in gorillas and chimpanzees compared to humans, with chimpanzees having paired roots in their first premolar and second premolar, gorillas' first premolar with this flattened complex root for the second premolar. It has to do with the size and angulation of the first premolar tooth. It's a very long tooth, sometimes angle in relation to the tooth row, that the roots provide reinforcement and attach the, the tooth to the lower jaw. Um, large teeth tend to have more roots than small teeth, so that's what's going on there. There are ways to get at tooth number, um, the root, root number in, in fossils. If, if you're lucky, um, you can get some idea from looking at the neck of the tooth because as teeth wear, the tooth erupts a little bit to compensate for the tooth wear. It will eventually expose the division between roots if any division is present. And you can do that with the first Liang Bua specimen, LB1. An easier way, if you have access to technology, is to, look at, is to use a CT scan and adjust the settings so rather than looking at the surface bone, you can look effectively through the, the bone at, at the roots underneath. Um, we did this with Liang Bu 1, and what you can clearly see there is the first premolar tooth has two roots on both sides of the jaw. And more particularly, the, the premolar, the shape of the roots means that the the, the back root, the one closest to the molar tooth, is very broad and plate-like, whereas the root in front of it is a narrow cone, like the base of an ice cream cone. And this root form, with a, a flat plate at the back and a fine um, conical-shaped root at the front, is again the same form which is distinctively and found in Homo habilis and some early Australopithecines. It's something that appears to be have great antiquity in, in our particular lineage and occurred in, in LB1. The question for me then was whether the second mandible found in uh, 2004 had the same root morphology as LB1. It was a little bit more difficult to work with because the CT scans taken have different resolution and they're taken a different way to the first lot of CT scans and so you can't look at it from the side and adjust the threshold values and take away the bone look at the tooth roots. What you have to do is take some slices down through the jaw and try and pick up individual roots. And if you take X-ray slices separated by a couple of millimetres, you can pick up the appearance of roots through the jaw. I did that with LB6, and when you take these slices through the jaw, you can pick up the fact that the first premolar has two roots, just like in LB1, Clearly, the difference in root shape between the front root and the second root shows up, with the second root having this broad plate-like appearance, just like in early Australopithecines and Homo habilis, whereas the first root is narrow and conical in shape. I haven't had time to do a 3D reconstruction of the tooth yet, because this is just something I thought about a few days ago. Um, so this is the first time I've used it anywhere. So both LB1 and LB6, these two mandibles, have this distinctive shape to the crown of their premolar teeth, a, 
a shape shared with the first isolated premolar, so we have at least three individuals from the Pleistocene layers at, at Liang Bua with this distinctive shape to their premolar teeth. They all have very distinctive roots. Each of these characters, premolar crown shape and the shape of the roots, are things which distinguish them from modern humans. It's very, very clear cut. I've now looked at uh, four to 5,000 sets of teeth, I suppose, in the last few years, and I've been unable to find any modern human with this particular set of characteristics. So for me, the, the premolars were quite important. In terms of Homo erectus, Homo erectus was adjacent on, on Java. Some of the Homo erectuses have multiple roots, but all of the Homo erectus have premolar crown shapes the same as modern humans. The same goes for Homo erectus in East Asia. Uh, the, the Chinese Homo erectus teeth from Jogger the End, described by Weidenreich, have crown shapes like modern humans, and they have a single conical root, don't have double roots. So in comparison to other Homo erectuses in the region, the Liang Bua material appears more primitive and earlier in time. Further afield, you can find um, teeth with similar crown shapes and root morphology at Dimonisi, the Dimonisi Homo erectus site in Georgia. Some of the specimens, there's lots of variation here, they're around about 1.8 million years old, Two of the specimens have elongated crowns and their first premolar teeth. At the same time, they have double roots on their first premolar tooth. And fortunately, in one of the specimens, the old man from Dimonisi, part of the side of the jaw has been broken away, exposing the tooth roots, and the first premolar root is narrow and conical. The second one is broad and plate-like, clearly very similar to the ones from, from Liang Bua. So the premolars gave me a clue that this was not a human, but when I looked at the, the jaw that which, to, which Thomas had cleaned, it was clear that the, there was big differences between the shape of the symphysis at the bottom of the jaw, both at the front of the jaw and the back of the jaw in comparison to modern humans as well. So here's a modern human jaw. The front of our jaw is quite vertical. It doesn't recede and go back in comparison to non-human primates, for example. Earlier hominins had a more sloping um, shape to the front of the jaw. At the back of the jaw, the, if you had a tongue view of the back of the jaw, again, the inside of the jaw is quite vertical, it's somewhat featureless and doesn't have raised bumps or tori on the inside of the jaw, something which happens in all non-human primates and is quite well developed in gorillas and chimpanzees, for example. So I knew about modern human um, synthesis and what I was interested in was finding out more about this, the same um, features present in the Liang Bua material. So this is just showing the primitive hominin condition where some of the early Australopithecines have this non-human primate-like condition, for example, where they, they don't have a preceding, uh, a pronounced bony jaw. This part of the jaw is receding. Um, at the inside of the jaw, there are two ridges of bone called tori with something of a depression in between them we call a fossa. This is supposed to provide some reinforcement uh, to the jaw during mastication, that's the argument, or may have to do with the fact that in particularly in gorillas and chimpanzees they have large canine teeth with large roots and so you have, a, have to have a particular structure to the front of the jaw to accommodate um, that canine size. So, so this is the primitive condition for our lineage, but something which is also occurring at Liang Bua as recently as 15, 16, 17,000 years ago. It wasn't supposed to be there. So I did a little bit of research on, on chins. I wanted to find out if there was any stage in human development where we replicated the condition in non-human primates, where we might have had a couple of tori in the inside of our chin and, and whether we always had chins anyway. And if you, There are two ways to go about this. You can deal with archaeological data or you can use a long-term growth study where you're looking at changes in a single individual through time. This is based on archaeological data from a very large... Edo period site in Taikyo, where there's about 700 beautifully preserved um, burials, including a large number of infants. And so it looks at change in the size and shape of the symphysis through time. And what you find if you, if you do this, you find out at birth we don't have a chin. We don't have this essential human characteristic of chin. But the front of our, our chin at birth, and up until around about five or six years of age, is very vertical. It's not like the non-human primate condition, it never slopes backwards, but it's quite vertical. But with the eruption and development of the teeth and growth of facial skeleton and the skull, 
And gradually, the, the depth of the lower jaw increases, and particularly in the symphysial region, the front of the jaw, and a chin starts to develop. And above the chin, the bone curves inwards, which makes the appearance of the chin. If the front of the, the jaw is quite flat, you wouldn't notice the bump at the bottom. So we get chins after around about five or six years of age. Before that time, we don't have them. Going on to a long-term growth study, um, this just repeated the same sorts of things, though I extended into a, um, an older age group. Again, chins don't start to appear until around about six or seven years of age, and they continue to develop till around about 24, 25 years of age. If your teeth wear down a lot, your, your um, chin morphology changes again later in life. So chins are a modern human thing, and they occur after you reach around about five. If you compare non-human primates and humans around about the same developmental age, first, first molar teeth have erupted, um, we have this flattened symphysis, we don't have a chin, but even at an early age we're very distinctive from those and um, the chin region in gorillas, chimpanzees, orangutans and things like that. So we've always, modern humans, certainly have this distinction. Back to Liang Bua. So this is what I first saw when I went to Jakarta in 2003, which made me decide permanently, as it turned out, that this skeleton LB1 could not be a member of our species. Not only did it have this distinctive premolars, but the um, mandibular morphology, the front of the lower jaw, had a receding chin, and on an anterior part of the lower jaw you had these two distinctive ridges of bone, these so-called tori, something which never have ever been found in modern human jaws, but are common in, in human fossils in Africa dating to two to three million years ago. It happened to also occur in the Dimonisi Homo erectuses. Two of the Dimonisi specimens at around about 1.8 million years ago have a similar morphology to the back of the jaw. And so again, this said to me quite clearly that this can't be a modern human. Um, and although I, people have said I reached this judgment too hastily, all of the research I've done in the following years, three to four years of travelling around the planet, has never been able to find a modern human with this set of features. There are no pathologies which replicate this condition either. Uh, when you chew, you, you bite on a nut, for example. Um, sometimes you chew on one side of the jaw, not both sides at the same time. It's called unilateral chewing, and the jaw distorts just a little bit. You don't notice what's going on, but it does. Um, there's a general argument that if you looking at the size and shape of the lower jaw, which is basically a bent beam, that it's built to res withstand structural failure, the likelihood that you bite too hard and your jaw breaks. It, basically, your teeth break before your jaw breaks, and I don't know of any example where someone has chewed quite forcefully and broken their lower jaw, which may just indicate that hundreds of thousands of years of human evolution actually work and that the mandible functions as it should. But this reinforcement on the inside of the jaw People have argued in, um, for Homo erectus and Australopithecines may provide extra reinforcement for high masticatory loads and forces, and there's some work underway with Homo frizensis to try and test that. One of the results of this work on premolars and chins is that you should be able to look at a lower jaw like this. This is a brand new fossil from Asia, hasn't been tested, hasn't been published yet. It's more than 80,000 years old. The basic question is, is it an example of Homo sapiens or not? And you should all be able to answer the question now in a couple of seconds. It has a nice prominent chin. It doesn't have tori on the inner part of the jaw. It has a single premolar root as well. So this is clearly a member of our species. And finally, um, a parting note. Your teeth may fail you and your knees may stop working, but you'll still be buried with this essential human characteristic because the chin goes with you wherever you go. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Unfortunately, due to technological glitches, we've run out of time. It's lunchtime. Hey. Uh, I would ask, uh, and you've been very, very good so far, if you would please return by 2.10 this afternoon so that we're on time for Matthew Tocheri's talk on tiny wrist bones and their big implications. For those of you who are not familiar with campus, there are maps at the help desk out front
There are several uh, venues on campus uh, that serve lunch. The Student Union, the SAC has a very good uh, chili, a little skimpy on the meat, but it's pretty good. Uh, Harry Men Cafe, uh, the Student Union, the SAC, and the Jasmine has a cafeteria here in the Wang Center. And if you feel like trekking across road, the uh, hospital cafeteria also has uh, food available. Thank you very much for your attendance and your attention this morning. We'll see you back at 2.10 this afternoon. Thank you. Uh, the joys of computers, right?